created for you podcast how we look at personal services and how people create special memories for people bespoke memories and today i have robert taylor and he's a photographer so he gave his bio and uh, do you want do you want me to say it or do you want to say what you do robert you read it out so i'll read it out nice so robert taylor the photographer robert explores and celebrates who people can be through por- i can't even say the word portraiture sorry i've never i've never i've seen it but i don't have to say so if you can just okay new graphic okay nudes collaborative projects beyond photography his work exhibited collectively widely is part of several permanent collections including the national portrait gallery and the victoria and albert museum wow so sorry as i struggled with that word portraiture is that how i say it could you explain what that is please a portrait in the simplest terms for me is an exploration of the individuality of a person. So when I photograph them, I want to show in different ways what is distinctive about them. And it's not just about what they look like, it's what it feels like to be in their presence. What is their essence? What is their character? What is it that makes them distinctive? So in that way, you could photograph identical twins and come up with quite different results. And we're going to delve into that today. So I'm very excited. Like a well-respected photographer, I have a wide collection, critically acclaimed, and we're going to delve into that. But before I do get into the nitty gritty and the wide scope of what, what you do, usually on this um, podcast, I ask some fire, fireside chat questions. And they're just questions to get to know you. <laughs> in the podcast <laughs> uh, because I do believe when people connect with people especially on podcasts they want to know who you are before they hear sometimes what you do and the personality and some of your thoughts so one question I ask what advice would you give to your 18 year old self trust your imagination in your creative endeavours a little more than you might Express what you really feel with tact mm-hmm. and integ- integrity. Is that is it? And don't be too and don't be too caught up with pleasing people and giving them what you think they want. Okay. Following on from that, what advice would you give to your twenty-seven-year-old self? Well. My 27-year-old self was on a bit of a roll. Life was good. I was having a lot of great opportunities, and I was grabbing them with both hands. I would probably, looking back on that time, say to my 27-year-old self, pause, smell the coffee, make sure you're making the most of what's going on. Okay. So you're talking about all these opportunities you was grabbing. So what were you doing? What, what, what were you grabbing? And how did you turn it into a great thing? Well, before, this was before my time as a full-time photographer. I was a young publishing executive for a UK-based company that published educational and cultural books in Nigeria. So I was back and forth to Lagos and traveling all over Nigeria doing research, a little bit of photography, and also briefing and debriefing cartographers. So I was living my dream. I was being paid to go and explore one of the most interesting and populous countries in Africa. Wow, that sounds like an adventure. Okay, and what are you curious about right now? Right now, Mm -hmm. I'm curious about what there is still to learn about what I can do what really matters to me and what my capacities to make that happen are. Okay. So very interesting, very, very concise. And now we're going to go, how did you start of being a photographer? How did you start? Because a lot of people think, you know, we have our iPhones, we can just like click everything. I'm a photographer now, visual expert. How, what was your journey and how, how did you start? It really started long before I had any thoughts of being a photographer as a career, 
I had asked my father, I think it was for my 21st birthday, if I could have a little camera just for running around. Being my father, he ignored my request for a simple camera, went out, researched it and realized that I ought to have a large, heavy duty, single lens reflex proper camera. The kind where you couldn't get any results out of it unless you were forced to learn the basics about photography, controlling light, exposure, and all of that sort of thing. So I was pleased that he'd gone to all that trouble, but quite irritated. But I just got on with it because I thought, take the opportunity. And for all of my time working in publishing, photography was the background, the hobby. But things got to the next level really when I got to meet somebody called Timmy Fanny Coyote. He was then a hot new prospect in the art photography world. He was making waves, getting exhibited, getting critical acclaim. Mm. And I was at a, a social group for, for men and somebody who knew I was a photographer said, oh, you never guess who's in the room. I hadn't heard of him at this stage, but I went over, had a conversation with him. And, you know, I had money. So I just said, well, I'd like to commission you to take my portrait just to see what all the fuss was about, really. And we had a photo session. It was a curious experience. But when I saw the results combined with his work process, it suddenly occurred to me, not only that photography could be so much more than just a technical challenge with aesthetics, I realized this really could be a powerful way to express myself explore connection with people and how they thought about themselves and just a whole bunch of other ways to be in a massive flow of creative play. So that meeting really changed my whole attitude to photography. And within two years, I had left publishing and become a full-time photographer. Wow. So that's, it's all started in Nigeria, I heard. Is that, did I hear that correctly? No, no, no. The inspiration was a Nigerian photographer okay. I met in London. Okay, so it's, you know, the diaspora and inspiration is all around. So yeah. there, there you go. Okay, so thank you for that. Okay, so you got your inspiration. That's how it was born. So how did you get your first commission? Well, this is where networks and being a bit of a tart really comes into play. I need to be a tart. Okay, I had a tell lot me. Of social tart, I hasten to add. Sorry? Social tart. I'm happy to social. be a tart so I can get the money. I know I'm a mess. No, 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 no. But I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Carry on. What I mean by that is um, already in my five years in publishing in London and before that, my time finishing off my qualifying as a barrister, I built up quite a strong network of friends. Mm -hmm. It was a lot to do with a very strong LGBT network, but it was much broader than that. I was just meeting an incredible number of people, and I was somebody who liked to go to parties, who liked to get out and meet new people. So that when it became a thing for me to be a, you know, more interested in photography, of course I was photographing lots of people mm, that I knew for mm. the fun of it. And when I was declaring to the world that I was stepping it up and having this be my job, my identity, the opportunities were there. You know, there were things that were offered, things to try out, I was not really somebody who was going out there knocking on doors and asking for it, but just things came my way. What? Yeah. I don't say lucky because you work hard and you're really good of what you do, excellent at what you do. But um, for me and other people who probably starting out, networking, I hear this all the time on this podcast, networking, organic friendships. Explain that because I've been in L London for 10 years and I'm struggling. I put my hand up. Tell me, tell me some, some tips. How did you organically have these relationships and the work just came to you like a magnet? Tell me, tell me. I, I let me be a bit more precise. Okay. Because I knew and liked a lot of people, I think one of the things that probably made it work a little better and make, made people think I'll take a chance with this, it was clear that I was genuinely interested in people. Mm. So mm. I had a lot of people who were not only prepared to be my experimental subjects, mm. but because they liked me and trusted me and seemed to appreciate my attitude to dealing with other people, I guess it made it safer for them to introduce me to their friends and people in their network 
So it wasn't the question that I got lots of friends and it all came to me. There were some things that I cultivated and there were some things that were part of my makeup that made it more likely that those opportunities would come. Okay, so, so it's a, okay. for a start, it was trying to listen to people. When we get into conversations, we're all trying to tell our story and sing our song. People like to talk about themselves when they think it's safe mm. and when they think you're sensitive mm. and when they believe that you're not a gossip who's going to be spreading their personal business around. So I think some of the opportunities that came my way were definitely to do with people trusting me. Mm. When I say it came to me, I don't mean I just sat there and the phone rang and that was it. There were conversations where I was keen to tell people what I did. Not that I was ramming it down their throat or asking for work, but I spoke about what I did briefly, lucidly, and with enthusiasm so that they got that I was available. So when I say opportunities came, I may have been at a party. I may have been volunteering for something. I may have been somewhere else where I got a chance to talk about what I did, and that is what attracted the opportunities. So it's a kind of networking. I never thought of it like that. I was just being myself. Okay. Good to know. I'm writing notes of things what I should be doing, <laughs> being in different spheres. One thing, one thing I would add to that, mm. I mean, I've talked about uh, the LGBT community. Now, when I was starting out in my photography, things are not the way they are these days. There was the AIDS crisis. There was Clause 28. There was a lot Oh, hold on one second. Raw... Clause what? 28. Sorry, I'm not sure. Clause 28. A piece of conservative government legislation that specifically prohibited local authorities and other agencies from promoting the homosexual lifestyle as a pretended reality. I, I can't remember exactly how they, they posted it, but it was state-sponsored homophobia. Now, that was bad enough. Add that to the impact on the gay community of the AIDS crisis. We were a community under siege. We could have gone under, but a lot of us got organized, fundraised, volunteered, supported each other, and we became quite a powerful force for our own survival because we were under attack. Now, that status actually worked for me. Now, the only reason I mention it is, is that we're all members of communities, whether it's around gender, interests, location, particular cultural interests, mm, particular mm. problems that we may have. Mm. Those communities can be great places to make connections, not always directly as clients, but because every single human being is at the core of their own network. And if you make a good impact with the right people, even if they are penniless or not interested in the arts or whatever else you think might limit their interest or ability to be mm. your client, mm. you don't know, they don't know people who might be. So when you're talking to somebody, remember you're talking to a community. Wow. So what I'm hearing, the relationships who you talk to is key, showing enthusiasm, showing a portfolio of good work. Don't dismiss people who you don't know, you know, the, the sixth degree of, um, of um, separation, you don't know who there is. And the exactly. power of a good re referral. If so you can get someone to trust you or someone to recommend you, it's in good stead. So that's, yeah. so that sounds that comes, like. And that comes back to what I was saying earlier on. When I say work came in, it came in often at one or two removes because somebody who wasn't necessarily a potential client themselves or didn't particularly have opportunities for me, but they did know people. So if that relatedness was there. And these conversations, there's a, an important distinction between speaking enthusiastically about what you do and trying to sales pitch everybody who you, comes into your company. Mm. You know, people, mm. it's a time to specifics how it works and whether or not to get work and it isn't necessarily in those conversations where you're being an enthusiastic ambassador for what you do the opportunity to pitch and hustle and get deals that comes later okay i hear you i hear you so okay so you can hear about the passion of connecting with people being human so can we talk about your way okay 
I, 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 I'm in two minds of two questions. Right, let me go with this one. What type of photography do you do? How would you sum up your photography? I make portraits. And as I said earlier, for me, a portrait exploration, celebration of that which makes somebody distinctively them. Okay. How we go about that will depend on what they want to end up with. And also, it will depend on the kind of experience that we judge together that they want. One of my biggest challenges, and it's an ongoing challenge, is to remember to listen and also be creative in how to respond. But I, I, there are many services that fail because the provider is not listening. They're not tuning in to what's okay. really going on with a customer. And sometimes, sometimes, some customers don't really know what they want, but you have to be so careful not to assume that you do know what they want. Okay, so having that balance. Okay, so we talked about what you do. Um, the, the type of portrait, um, the type of photography, what you do. So who is your yeah. ideal customer or ideal client or people you, you work with? Who, who are they? There are several different kinds of ideal clients. But if we're talking about business, mm -hmm. we're talking about an institution with a big fat budget, a hands-off attitude, some imagination, and some clear idea of where they're headed, which isn't the same as knowing exactly how it should end up. But okay. it's my job to work out with them for sure what's going to bring them the best outcome. Okay. And so I mention institutions because, generally speaking, the institutions that I've worked with, they have budgets and they have already some idea about the value of what I do and why it's going to cost so much and all the rest of it. Individuals can be fun to work with, but with a few exceptions, they don't usually have enough money to make it that interesting if it's about money. That's not to say that I don't do all I, in the past. It's not to say that I haven't done work that wasn't about the money if I cared about the cause or the client or the individual. But if you're talking money, institutional clients are off the scale my ideal clients okay so what i've heard people who can pay you that's what i heard no not just pay me work with me as well okay he, there no. are lots of people who got money who are my idea of hell and i don't want to work with them okay so that's that's what i was getting at it's about the the, the intention the aspirations of this client and making it a fit because it's a bespoke service. It's, it's something what you're creating is, is experience. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. example. Um, let's say in the last nearly 10 years, um, my work, more than that, actually more like 15, my work has been a lot to do with making collections of portraits commissioned by special projects or institutions that want to celebrate excellence and achievement in women. It started with a series of portrait collections that I was commissioned to make of award-winning women scientists and engineers. Mm -hmm. And that's now morphed into a succession of commissions from Oxford University colleges who want to celebrate excellence in their female alumni and you know, current uh, fellows as well. The idea being that although most of the university institutions are now properly and functionally co-educational, that is, that they have men and women at every level of power, mm, mm, mm. there is a problem in that their walls still look like 19th, and in some cases, 18th century institutions with large, beautiful portraits of dead men. And I've been commissioned to make collections that bring women onto those walls. Yeah, fine, because women contribute to a lot to society and, you know, half of the world. So why not have them, you know? And it, it kind of breaks down the stereotypes of just men and intellect and so much women contribute so much stuff. So. so it's my great pleasure to go into those very traditional looking and seeming institutions 
and provide them with material to help them modernize their sense of self and the, what they say to themselves, say to the world about themselves, institutions. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting work. Wow. Okay. I see. I see what you're saying. So I wanted to make, when I was asking about the money, I was making a joke because um, I've had photographers here before. It's just that sometimes, you know, when you do the weddings and the personal stuff, it's just, it's just very, very, very tricky and very, very, very stressful. And it's not sometimes the right fit for certain photographers. So it seems like what you're doing... It, oh, sorry, Karen. No, for sure. When I first started out, I had to get as much experience and income as I could. Mm -hmm. I shot weddings. I shot a lot of things I wouldn't touch now. You, when you're starting out, you need the experience, you need the opportunities. It's still a tremendous challenge to work out what you should be doing as opposed to just grabbing anything you can. Uh, as soon as I could dial out of the stress of weddings, I was gone because, you know, I don't need that kind of hassle. And it's, and it's not that I have any contempt for weddings, but it's a particular kind of work that is not of interest to me. I know some photographers who enjoy it, who do it extremely well and they give a very good service. It's, so it's also, if you're going to flourish, it's about realizing what you can do well and that is going to be financially viable for you. And As also for your mental health. I could not be well if I was shooting weddings. I would not be a well man. I hear you. I hear you. As an artist, I, I, I call myself an artist in different ways or, you know, we have to find ways how to... So survive and your passions you know when I make jewelry there's certain things you know I make when I first started I'm not too sure but you know as you develop you you, you know and get more experience you can choose or have the or have the ability to choose what you can do and what on what you choose not to do so I, I really appreciate that, that that honesty okay so that's there so when you get your commissions now or recent commissions how do they find you or how do you like kind of connect and then what is the experience from the phone call or the email to actually the finished picture you know or well, or, or well, the well, aftercare there are two parts to that question in mm -hmm. terms of these days mm -hmm. i don't pitch at all what? every single job that i get through the educational sector, that is Oxford uh, University and other institutions of that kind, they contact me usually by email, and it's usually along the lines of, uh, we've just seen your collection at so-and-so college, do you come and talk to us about doing something similar or something related to that for us? They already know the work, I've been around a long time, so people who contact me now know what they're getting. And I've also been told a couple of times that there are, of course, informal conversations that I will never know the contents of, where it's not only what's the work, because anybody can go and see that, but what's he like to work with. And I've been told that people like the way that I work, that women feel comfortable with me, that I have an, uh, a collaborative and inclusive process which means that whatever we're going to end up with, my subjects feel some sense of engagement and involvement with it. And, of course, when I talk to any client, particularly an institution that mm. has values and mission statements mm. and things that they want to promote about themselves in the world, it's particularly important that I sit down with them, however many times I've done it before, sit down with them and try and get as clear as possible what I think that want to end up with. So that I can either then say, this is how I deliver it, or if I think there's something not quite right about what they think is possible, to ex discuss with them and just try to get to a place where they feel as committed to what is going to happen as I do. Because it's no point just trying to give, you know, pretend I can give them what they want if I don't think it's going to work. My process is usually, though, more about making suggestions about ways that it could be improved. For instance, I don't think I've shot a collection of portraits in a very long time that doesn't include an opportunity as part of the process for all the subjects to have a chance to write two to three hundred words where they can talk in their own language, on their own terms, about 
their relationship to whatever it is they're being acknowledged for, their relationship to the institution that's commissioning the photographs, so that it's a much more rounded and democratic process. And the people I work with in, who anticipate the subjects I photograph in these projects, knowing that that care is being taken, come to it with a much more open and committed relationship rather than just thinking, oh my God, I've got to have my photograph taken. It's almost like going to the dentist for some people if they don't feel they're involved. And I try to make it as involving as possible. Okay. So what I'm hearing is there's a process of getting to know someone, the listening, tailoring what they're feeling or towards whatever they're getting photo photographed for. And sometimes, if you will, probably some in, in insecurities. Because as a woman, I'm just, I'm just, like, I was like, for myself, I was like, as a woman getting photographed, I, I hate it. I don't want it. I don't want to. Uh, it's lots, lots, lots of pro, um, a pressure to be ph photographed. Ex explain how you deal with women. <laughs> explain. Well, the context is, the great majority of women I photograph now, they're mature, by which I mean over 35, 40. Ooh, by virtue of being as <laughs> successful as they've been, they've been around the block. What I find horribly unfair is that if I get sent to photograph a man, either a senior politician, a captive industry, or somebody else, these days it's still the case, as long as they've scrubbed up reasonably, the portrait is about their character, their charisma, their ability, their intellectual abilities. A woman of similar age and similar achievement is judged mm. in some ways wildly inappropriately on their aesthetic, their sex appeal, their clothing choices, just so many things that are completely irrelevant to their ability to do the thing that they're being celebrated for. So they know, and I know, that these photographs are going to be a really exquisite balancing act being allowing, uh, allowing them both to bring themselves on their own terms as a presence and, and, and in a way anticipate some of the things that are going to be irrelevant but still judged. So it's a very, it's a difficult balancing act. So for every single person I photograph, I tell my clients, the organization, that I will want to have a conversation with every single subject on the phone before we meet so that we can discuss their issues, their concerns, what they might be wearing, where we'll be doing it, the conditions that we need to create so that they can be at their relaxed and comfortable best. Okay, suppose you get very camera shy p people like me uh, who doesn't want, who really find it really hard. How do you get them relaxed and calm and get their good side? How do you do that? Especially for. Oh. Here's, the, here's the thing. There's a tiny minority of people I get to photograph who say to me, wow, let's go. I can't wait for this. I'm really looking forward to it. The great majority of people fear, and in some cases they're terrified. They have very low expectations, probably got deep-seated self-esteem issues about their appearance or their attractiveness mm. or whatever it is they think they should be like. So for me, it is normal to be working with people who have at least an ambivalence about the process and the likelihood that the results are going to be good. So they need to be taken care of. I'm not going to tell you my formula for doing this. Oh, I want your formula. No, 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 no. It depends on who I'm working with. Okay. If you listen to the people as they talk, you get to hear specifics about where they're at and what they're going to need for this process to work. And that's where I start to make my decisions about how it's going to be handled. And quite separate to that, on any particular day, people will be in the mood they're in, they'll be where they're at, and you have to tune in as far as you can to what that is about that day and make it work in that moment. So there isn't a formula. I, this isn't a sausage machine. What I do to make it work depends on who I'm working with. Bespoke, individual, and tailored. Completely. Completely. Okay. Okay, so we've looked at the customer experience. So you do all that, you're with them, and then the photo happens. You, 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 know, you, you take the picture. What happens afterwards with your client or, or with the, the, the subject? Well, again, something that's built in baked into the process, I always persuade my client institutions that not only should I have that conversation beforehand, 
but I also persuade them that as it's photography and not painting, there are going to be between a couple and maybe a half a dozen or more images, all of which could be the one that is chosen to hang in the collection on the wall or mm -hmm. go into the publication. I make sure that it's understood that every single subject will get to see a choice so that they can ex at least get the chance to express a view about either which they like more or which ones they don't want us to use. And in some cases, some people just want to hand over the decision to us. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. usually people are very grateful for the chance to have some say in what is chosen out of the various options mm -hmm. that we've created. Okay. How did you get into the V&A and the National Portrait Gallery? How did you work there? In the case of the National Portrait Gallery, it's the same thing I was talking about earlier on. A friend of mine, who I didn't know that he knew somebody who knew the man who was in charge of the photographs at the V&A, but he'd seen my work, my friend had seen my work, so he got me to show my work to his friend, and his friend was in the network of the man who was the curator of photographs at the National Portrait Gallery. So he procured an introduction and I was invited to go into the National Portrait Gallery and show them my portfolio. I went in expecting a pat on the head saying, nice work, if I was lucky, and keep going. But I just completed a major commission for um, the organization that used to give degrees to polytechnics before they expired. And it was a lot of people at the high end of the academic world in the polytechnic side. Lord this, lady that, sir the other, and a lot of other mm -hmm. people eminent even if not bold and he went through my portfolio a second time and then he on the spot said that he wanted to buy eight of my pictures <laughs> six of them were the usual suspects white middle-aged with a title two of them interestingly were black people <laughs> Marsha Hunt the singer and writer who famed for uh, West End stage productions as an actor, actress and singer. And the other person was um, Isaac Julian, the black gay filmmaker and artist. I was completely gobsmacked. Whoa. They've since gone on to buy in, a t in total 22 of my pieces of work, some of which have hung a couple of times. The most famous picture I've had there is a picture I was able to, to get together of the first three black women to be uh, become members of the House of Lords, upper legislative chamber. It was a big deal, and that picture hung for a long time, and I was extremely proud of it, and it seemed to give a lot of people a lot of pleasure to see a photograph that embodied and celebrated a black presence at the highest levels of UK national life. Wow. Okay. And in a similar way, a much smaller number of pictures I have in a collection of the V&A were through an introduction. Somebody said, show this man your work, and they immediately wanted a couple of them. So I was very happy to hand those over. Well, I need to hang around you, your friends, and everybody. And I believe it. Because I, 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 I well, have this not. dream. I have this dream. I always want to be... V&A is my probably my favourite museum or gallery in the world, probably. And I, I love it. You and me too. I, I love I, the v &A. Yeah. So it's my dream as a jeweller. I'm going to, don't know how it's going to happen. I'm manifesting in the world and podcasts and vibrations, but I'm going to have a jewellery collection there. I don't care. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But it's been, it's one of my legit dreams. Like there and, and li liberties, I'm going to get my jewellery in. I'm going to get my jewellery somehow, somehow. Well, Cassandra, you are a remarkable woman of resilience, creativity, and with great courage. I have a suspicion that if there was a way that your jewellery could be more an, an expression of your creativity, that there would be more of a likelihood that some of your dreams for your jewellery could come true. Oh. What I also know is that I know nothing about the jewellery industry, so we'd have to have a conversation about what that means. Okay, that's it. So what I'm hearing from you is like, make more jewellery about like my personality and my authentic self. Do more of that. Show that shine brightly. I'm working on it. 2020 is my year. I'm working on 
what does Cassandra Lauren, the brand, or, you know, what, what are my projecting to world? Not what just probably my, my customers want, because I yeah. feel like I, I get it. Good. What I understand is that you have to make your living. Yeah. So like anybody who does something creative, you have to find a balance between what you can find a market for and what is going to sell in sufficient numbers that the bills get paid and you get the chance to keep going and sustain a presence in your field. Mm -hmm. What And I do recognize that I have been lucky, but I also realize that I had opportunities to make work that was, one way or another, a distinctive expression of who I was, which meant that it wasn't for everybody, particularly in the early phase of my photographic career when I was doing quite a bit of experimental work it was definitely a minority taste, but I did have the advantage of being able to connect with an audience for that minority taste, rather than trying to find my little perch in a huge mainstream field that is already overpopulated with people chasing the conventionally tasteful. Nothing wrong in that, but if you want to make money, you need to make a noise and you need to make a space for yourself. And being distinctive is risky, it's frightening, but if you forge your head in your own direction with conviction, there's a chance that if it connects, it's going to connect bigger than just being another one delivering nice stuff. Okay. I heard that in my, I, I felt that in my soul. <laughs> I thought you were talking to me. <laughs> I thought you were talking to me, really. <gasps> okay. So my next question is, what is the most fun you had on, 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 on a shoot? What was your favorite shoot? After 30 years, well, 35 years of taking pictures, and 30 years doing it professionally, mm -hmm. that is literally an impossible question to answer. As often as not, I feel most passionately about what I've just done because it's the thing that mm. I'm still in. Um, it'd be impossible to say my favorite shoot. There are some that are strategically more important, some that were more of a scream, some that surprised me, some that moved me, but the, the one I, uh, no, I couldn't, I couldn't oh. say. There are two, there are too many thrills for that to be an wow. answer. Wow. Oh, okay. It's like asking like a record artist, what's, what's your favorite song? Oh, no, I can't do it. They're all my babies. Okay. All right. I tried. I tried with my lazy questioning to get an answer out of you. So I, I was not successful. The more particular your questions, the more likely it is that I can give you an answer. Okay. Improve my journalism skills. Okay. Great. I'm, go <laughs> I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to come to you every time. Like, are my questions good enough? Okay, so is this a good question? In the age of the digital life with our lovely iPhones or, you know, or DLSR or whatever we have, and we want to, we want to start out in, 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 in photography or we want to be better in, you know, on our Instagram or whatever medium, what are the key things to take a great photo in your opinion? Well, I think... Assuming that there is technical competence and aesthetic skill and a, and a context, you are providing, well, sorry, not you. I feel that I am providing not just a service and a product, I'm providing an experience, mm. a process. And particularly at this end of my career, because it is coming towards its close. In Lies. Way, I'm, I'm drawing on a lot of experience of knowing that it's very light to work out, that it's okay to take some risks, that it's okay to ask questions. It's not just about everything running smoothly, though of course you want to give people the best experience they can. But the reason that I still think it's worth me offering my services, because I'm offering quite a, a layered, I hope kind, and I hope enjoyable experience. So people haven't just got a thing at the end of it, a photo to stick in a frame or exploit in some commercial way. They've actually had an experience that taught them something about themselves and the world. Okay. So I've, he I've heard about what you can give. So maybe I didn't answer my, great uh, qu uh, my question greatly. Um, my question, what I was trying to get out was, a layman like me, who wants to take a good, good photo, what are the key things I need to do or think about from iPhone to DLSR, from a disposable camera, what are the key things for someone like me, a layman, to be, to be aware of to, to take a really good, good photo? Well, you have to 
answered a few questions for me before I could even know my, my mouth. What kind of photograph, what subject matter, oh, what okay. was this, what you want to end up with, mm -hmm. who is it for? There are so many things that go into that exercise succeeding. I'd need to know a lot more before I could give you a meaningful answer. I mean, I could spout generalities at you, but I'm not sure how useful they'd be. The more precise you could be about what, okay. why, when, and what you want to end up with, the more precisely I could speak to it. But th and even then, only if it was really in my area of interest and expertise. I know the world is full of photographers who do things that I don't brilliantly. All why right. would I step in their, right. their yard? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you again. How can I take a decent um, por portrait? Me, beginner stage. How can I take a decent portrait? Is this of somebody that you know well? Um, let's say my mom. Okay. Trickier than you think because they, you will both think you know who you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And actually a successful portrait is going to say something authentic and fresh and special about somebody. So you're going to have to use a, an odd balance of really knowing them very well, but trying to discover them anew. And then it's going to be find out what it is that matters to them so that the photo session, if it's short or long, is something that they could enjoy rather than something that's done to them. So before you start coming with your big ideas about what you want and how you want to do it, have a conversation. Find out what their issues are and let that be the guide to what you decide you're going to do, how you're going to do it and how much you're going to let them have some say in the process. And it may be that they have no say mm. depending on what they say to you. Mm. It, it does come back to this honouring the individual you're with. You're asking me for a formula where I actually think it's an exquisite cocktail for the person you're working with. Okay, a And it's cocktail. about discovery. All right, a cocktail I would love to get drunk on because I need to understand this, <laughs> like, this, this, this photography life. Um, is there anything, before I wrap up, is there anything I haven't asked you that you want to say about your, 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 your methods, the way how you work with clients, about your photography, anything that I haven't said with my um, very um, said limited journalism skills? Anything I haven't I have said. not commented on your journalism skills, and I'm going to <laughs> now. What, the only thing that I would add, two things I would add. Mm -hmm. uh, one is be lucky. Mm -hmm. But the final useful thing I would want to say, and this I think would extend beyond the business of photography, is um, be brave. Wow. Be brave. I feel that in my soul. You need to be fearless, to be brave, especially as an artist and creative, especially in, in this world, especially in these in these lovely times of coronavirus and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. I mean, because I, you know, I am old enough to be the grandparent of some people who might be thinking of starting out now. Mm. I'm also cautious about laying out my pearls of wisdom like this is the truth. I've spoken my truths. One of the things I find fascinating about meeting all kinds of creative people is the endless variety of ways that people make it work, partly because they mm. know themselves well enough to know where they can flourish mm. and where they should mm. stay out of it. Mm. And also what, what courage means to one person means something very different to somebody else. For me, it took courage to leave behind a very conventional, fairly successful life to branch out into the precarious world of the creative. For me, it took courage to go into many situations where the people I was working with were not like me. They weren't my race, they weren't my class, they weren't my background, they weren't my sexuality, and feel comfortable that what I was dealing in was the currency of being human and not getting too hung up on being me. Uh, particularly, I think, in the creative realm, if you're dealing with other people, you have to get out of your head and look at who's in front of you and get into their world. Listen, empathize, be kind, be sympathetic, be encouraging. 
and forget about yourself and your own dramas and your own inadequacies. Okay, I just feel like you 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 talked about my life. Okay, so I'm <laughs> just going to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I just, I just feel like I just need to just like re, re, rethink my whole life in in a nice way, in a nice way. I need to do this. I need no, but it's truth. Sometimes I don't get to talk to people like you, you like you who who speak their truth. It's not hiding behind the facade of stuff. The authentic self. And I, as as a grown up now in my thirties, I'm like I'm trying to be an authentic, more authentic person, and to show that in my artistry and to show that in the jewelry what I create and whatever I whatever my endeavors and sometimes it's been a struggle but now I'm I'm embracing it and 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 I appreciate your 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 truth like and I feel like in this podcast people will feel that and encourage people to do that even though when people just want you to be homogenous and do the same things and be safe you know standing out it's a different it, 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 it makes it makes you different it's like your it's your selling point so why not it's too life is too boring and boring just to be boring right so well well for me there's nothing quite so boring as swimming in my own dramas the world comes to life when i'm looking out and listening and connecting looking at what's going on over there and what people need rather than thinking how hard it is for me can i do this what do they think of me all that stuff it just reduces you okay and people boring people aren't interested in our dramas no they're not <laughs> they're not they don't they don't care <laughs> they don't care no, oh, they, don't. they don't care i know that from first fact no one cares i'm a messy well, but no, no that's not true it's not that they don't care but when i meet somebody i'm mm. wanting to you know i'm at a party i'm in the social event or i'm in a professional situation mm. i want to know about that i'm inviting them to bring their best that's mm. what i want to hear about if I'm sitting down with my close friend mm. or my buddy or my mm. bestie and I can see all over their face that life is not treating them well, I invite them, I offer them my ear and my time as much as I can. But if I'm meeting people out there, a social engagement for me is an invitation to explore their best. And what's really exciting is when you create the conditions where people are perhaps not as clear as they might be about what their best is and you're trying to draw it out gently, sensitively, that's exciting. I'm not trying to get somebody to tell me how terrible their life is, you know, I mean, you know, what can I do? Okay. So on a positive note, how how can people listen um, no find find you, your work, be current on what you're up to? Even though we will put it in, in, in the show notes, but just tell me. Well, the easiest way to see what I get up to in a very superficial way is my website. Okay. But I have to stress, for me, a website is like a very gentle invitation into my world. If they really want to know what I could offer them, they need to be talking to me. And they can send me an email through my website. That is where the process starts. The pictures on the website are just evidence that I took some pictures. They may or may not be relevant to what you do. There's a lot of work that I make that is very private, very focused on specialist projects. By definition, the few things I have on a website are just showing some of what I've done a while ago. But if you really want to know what's possible for you, let's talk. Okay. So there you have it, Robert Taylor, the photographer, the extraordinaire who does portraits and and has make women feel at ease and obviously men but women feel at ease with their looks and bring out the best in them and um show them in a refreshing way so i appreciate all the knowledge uh, you know what 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 you gave me me personally and i feel our listeners will get a lot of knowledge uh, you know get something out of it as well so it's always been a pleasure i do appreciate it and um you this is created for you thank you I just say my thank you. Okay. Which is to say your questions were fascinating and challenging and it was a wonderful opportunity to refresh my view of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So thank you very oh, much. Very charming. Thank you very much. Just listeners, I paid him to say that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing I did it. I did it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks for that. 